All right, well, thank you guys for coming out. Um, so, uh, like Michelle said, I'm Caleb Black, and this is one of my special areas. Uh, what I'm presenting today is actually from a book chapter uh, in the book that we released that I ended in last spring, I guess. Uh, so, before I do anything else, I always like to acknowledge folks that have helped out with this, and so these are actually the uh, student co authors on the book chapter. Uh, and where they are now. So, uh, Elisa Husky, who was my uh, second author, she's at Virginia Tech now, uh, doing her PhD in clinical psychology. David Weed, who's one of our master's students, now works with the Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, Michael Highfield, who uh, is one of our school site graduates, is now working in Putnam City Schools. Uh, and then Lauren Craig, uh, the final author on this, uh, she's currently at the University of Oklahoma finishing her doctorate. Appreciate all their help. Before we get into talking about what causes OCD, we need to have some nice operation definition of what OCD is, because <laughs> otherwise we don't know what we're talking about. So, what we're talking about when I say OCD is obsessive compulsive disorder, which is a type of psychopathology, a type of mental disorder that's defined by excessive, unreasonable obsession and compulsions. I'll define those specifically. Um, previously, in the DSMs 1 through 4, it was classified in the anxiety disorder section. Uh, in DSM 5, they sort of separated up OCD and a number of other disorders, supporting disorder and things like that, over into their own unique section called obsessive compulsive and related disorders. But as we will see, it's very much driven still by anxiety. So, if we're defining uh, in the DSM-5, what OCD is. Uh, first, it's the presence of having either obsessions or compulsions. Uh, this is different from the previous DSM-4, and then in DSM-4 you were supposed to have obsessions and compulsions. Turns out that between 95 and 98% of people with OCD do have both, uh, but there's a very, very small subset uh, that we have existence proofs for that just either have compulsions for example, very small children who are unable to tell you what the thoughts are that are driving that, or just obsessions. Uh, so what's an obsession? Well, an obsession is an intrusive, unpleasant, recurrent thought that uh, can take place in terms of an urge to do something. It can be you know, a sentence, just sort of a thought that goes across your head. It can be a verbal uh, you know, paragraph. It can be an image that you see, just some sort of cognition. That when I have it, I'm very disturbed by it, uh, it's very distressing to me, and then what I try and do is I try to get rid of that distress by in some way neutralizing it. Uh, and that tends to be through some sort of an action or some sort of another thought that we describe as a compulsion. So uh, I have a thought, it's very disturbing, unwanted to me, and then I try and do something to get rid of that anxiety. So an example of some common types of obsessions would be things like uh, I see, let's say, my child, and I have an intrusive, unwanted thought of me picking up a knife and stabbing him with it. I don't want to do that, uh, which is why it's an unwanted thought, uh, rather than someone being a psychopath. <laughs> it causes lots of distress. Uh, or doubts that I didn't do something. Uh, oh, I don't remember if I turned the oven on. I don't remember if I uh, unplugged the hairdryer. I don't remember if I locked my doors. So I doubt that I did something. A uh, very common one are intrusive thoughts of being contaminated. So I think that I'm going to get sick or something because I touched the door handle or maybe I had to go to the public restroom or something like that. And so I fear that I'm contaminated by something. Uh, and then our other really common area. Uh, it's what's sometimes called forbidden thoughts, but these are morally or sexually repugnant thoughts. So things that go against what I actually believe, but I have intrusive imagery of those. Um, so, you know, for example, it's not uncommon for people to have religious obsessions. Uh, we'll see some examples of that with the case that I demonstrate later, uh, where I am afraid that I've blasphemed in some way or I've offended uh, you know, whatever deity it is that I believe in uh, in some sort of terrible way. And so those are obsessions, again, unwanted, intrusive, unpleasant, cause distress. 
Now, compulsions, on the other hand, are what you do to try and get rid of that distress. Uh, and so these can either be repetitive behaviors, uh, mental acts, you know, something I can see physically or something that I'm doing up here that I feel like I have to do in order to get that anxiety from the obsession to go away. Um, and they tend to be very rigid. So for example, let's say that I have an obsession of, you know, I got germs on my hands because I touched something that somebody else had touched. And so I might get sick from that. What we then see in OCD is that, well, then I have to go wash my hands. But it's not just like, oh, my hands are dirty, I have to wash my hands. It's now I have to wash my hands in a very ritualized fashion for, let's say, maybe 10, 15 minutes with the water as hot as I can physically stand it. And I have to get every single finger as if I'm going into surgery. And unless I do that, I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel okay. I still feel anxious and nervous. And so again, what these try and do, these big compulsions, is they try and relieve your distress. They try and relieve your anxiety. Um, but they're not actually connected in this realistic way to things that are actually dangerous. So for example, I can wash my hands for 35 seconds with hot water and soap, and they're just as clean as they'd be after washing them for 15 minutes in terms of germs and things like that. But if I have OCD, I go way above and beyond because of these rigidistic rules that I have. So some common compulsions we see, hand washing, which I've already mentioned, um, which is usually involved in the contamination of sessions. Uh, ordering, so everything has to be a particular way. Everything has to be a particular way or something bad's going to happen. Uh, checking, so, well, now uh, I can't remember. Did I leave the oven on or not? I don't know. i got to go back and i got to check. Then I get down in the car and then I go, oh, did I really check it? Did I really make sure it was off? I'm not sure. So I go back and check it again and again. Uh, praying is a very common one that we see. Um, and you'll see an example of that later. And it's usually to neutralize these obsessions related to some sort of offense at uh, a particular deity or something like that. Counting is a really common one. We see people who count their steps. Uh, people who have to turn the radio up by three instead of being able to just kind of turn it up to however they want. Like, nope, it's got to go from one to four to seven to ten to thirteen, or otherwise, it just doesn't feel right. And then we see a lot of people who do things like, okay, I have to think a good thought to undo this bad thought, this obsession that I just got. So, in people with OCD, these tend to be very time consuming. Now, they take up a lot of time, uh, generally at least an hour a day, and they cause a lot of distress. Now, uh, as we were discussing a little bit earlier, behavior is on a continuum. Now, basically, everybody has something that they're a little twitchy at. Uh, you know, something has to be this way, this has to be this way. But if it doesn't cause you significant distress and impairment, that's not OCD. In OCD, what we see is that, oh, this is causing a big problem. Uh, this is making me late for school uh, because I had to retie my shoes 14 times before you get out of the uh, One gentleman that I uh, treated had not brushed his teeth uh, in about five years which is pretty problematic, it turns out, for your, your uh, mouth health. Why? Well, because his OCD was such that he had to brush his teeth in a very specific way, and the last time he remembered brushing his teeth, it took him about three hours to brush his teeth. And so that became so problematic that he started avoiding that altogether. Uh, the same guy, when I saw him, hadn't showered in about three months, because the last time he had showered, it took 12 hours, uh, which sounds like a terrible shower. Because uh, no one has that much hot water. Like, that's, that's not going to work. Um, and so, you know, what we see then is we see that these obsessions and compulsions are numerous, they're problematic, they cause lots of difficulty. The four big types of symptoms that we see in OCD uh, are hoarding issues, so feeling like I have to save something. Uh, and this isn't necessarily the same thing as a hoarding disorder, it's just kind of a unique, separate thing. This is, I have to save it because I have a thought that something bad will happen if I do throw it out. So i gotta, I got to save all of these scraps of paper because, you know, some, there might be something useful on them. You know, I've got to save these rocks. Why? I don't know if something bad's going to happen if I don't. 
Uh, contamination, which then leads to lots of cleaning behaviors. Uh, symmetry, so things have to be just right and have to be the perfect way, or otherwise, you know, something bad's going to happen. Uh, and then these forbidden thoughts, these sexual, morally repugnant thoughts, uh, which relates a lot to the uh, religious obsession. Somewhere between 1% and 3% of the population, depending on the way you survey this, uh, qualifies for a diagnosis of OCD. Uh, and this is cross-culturally. So this is not a, uh, you know, just in one culture that we see this. And it turns out this has some really important implications that we'll talk about later in terms of the evolutionary aspects of OCD. There's a lot of what we call subclinical cases, around 5% of the population. And they aren't either having them for an hour, a day, or more or they aren't being significantly distressed by them. But they're still having a significant number of OC symptoms. In children, uh, it's about 1% of the population, and that's uh, primarily male. It's about 75 to 85% male. Uh, and then as you become an adult, those numbers even out. So much heavier on the male side. Uh, and then, you know, like I mentioned, almost all patients have both obsessions and compulsions. It's very rare to just have one. So now that we've kind of defined that and sort of learned a little bit about OCD, we'll get into the crux of my talk, uh, which is, okay, well, what causes it? <laughs> uh, so etiologically, what are the factors that contribute to whether someone develops or doesn't develop OCD? Um, what I want to talk about first are th the three primary perspectives that we have today that have evidence to support them. Uh, but then I also want to emphasize that, uh, and you'll see this towards the end of the talk, there's really a need to not just say, oh, well, this is what causes OCD. Because in psychology, uh, to focus on any one level of explanation uh, ignores the others at your peril. And it turns out that if I just focus on only the psychological, only the biological, only the evolutionary factors behind the development of OCD, I lose a lot of really good needed information about what causes this and why we have this as a species. So integrating these things into an Evo, bio, psycho, social model can help to span these multiple levels of explanation. So first, I want to talk a little bit about psychological causes. Um, throughout history, uh, we actually have very good recorded uh, written descriptions of people that have OCD, basically as long as we have recorded information. Um, there have been a lot of explanations that are non-evidence-based that have been put out there. Possession, communication by the gods in some way, uh, psychoanalytic Freudian perspectives, uh, for example, none of those are really supported. What we do have is we have three very heavily supported psychological theories. Uh, and these are the behavioral, the cognitive, and then a combined model, which we'll talk about last, the cognitive behavioral model. So the behavioral sort of viewpoint on OCD. Uh, very much stems from work in the 40s, 50s, and 60s by a psychologist named Mauer, and his understanding of how fear is developed and then maintained. Uh, and this is called the two-stage theory of fear. And briefly, I'm going to walk through some examples kind of so that everybody can see exactly how this happens. Uh, but briefly what happens is that a particular individual who has OCD learns that anxiety, learns that fear via classical conditioning. And then that fear is maintained via operant conditioning, which is why this is called two-stage or two-process theory. <clears throat> and so what you basically have is you have something that is initially a neutral stimulus, which through classical conditioning becomes a conditioned fear stimulus. And then that fear that's caused by that stimulus is maintained via negative reinforcement. Uh, and that's a lot of very technical, fancy terms, which is why I have an illustration to help us understand so, uh, I'm going to use the same case to illustrate throughout this entire talk about what's going on. So, uh, let's say we have a little boy whose name is Mark. All right? um, Mark, initially, is not going to show any sort of response or reaction to an upside-down cross symbol. Right? That's going to be a neutral stimulus. You know? If I show a baby a picture of an upside-down cross, they don't go, oh, no. You know, uh, there's no response. It's a neutral stimulus that doesn't cause any reaction. So, initially, what we have is this again, this neutral stimulus. Uh, 
But at some point, let's say that Mark is drawing, just having a good time, uh, drawing, and then one day he draws, uh, accidentally, an upside down cross. And then what happens is his mother sees that uh, and yells at him, what have you done? Because of her background, where that's a very negative symbol, that's an evil symbol, uh, that's not something that people should be doing, she then yells at him. And it turns out a parent yelling and getting upset is what we would call an unconditioned fear statement. Because that's going to cause Mark to get upset cry, feel distressed, and feel anxious. Now, just drawing it is not. There has to be some sort of a connection there. And so, you know, this previously neutral stimulus thing, the upside down cross, uh, comes to serve as a signal for something bad occurring. So in other words, it goes from a neutral stimulus to a conditioned stimulus. Uh, and in this case, a conditioned fear stimulus. So, what happens then is that Mark, because of his uh, religious education, has been taught that you need to pray, that you need to ask for forgiveness, and you act in a sinful manner. And so when this neutral stimulus then becomes a condition of fear stimulus, causes him to cry, what he then does is he does something to try and get rid of that. Get rid of that bad feeling he has because he's acting sinful, for example. And so the next time he either saw something like this, maybe he accidentally drew this when he uh, was trying to make a T and he drew the line a little bit too, too low, then he starts feeling very bad because that neutral stimulus again has become the condition of fear stimulus, causes this unconditioned the condition of fear response, which then he tries to get rid of. And he's learned that I need to pray to get rid of these feelings. And so then he prays. And what that does is that removes an aversive feeling from him. Because I feel better now. And it turns out that act, that removal of that aversive feeling, that removal of that stress, is very highly reinforcing. And it's what we call negatively reinforcing. And so, unfortunately, what that does in people with OCD and other anxiety problems, though, is that just makes those intrusive, unwanted thoughts more likely to happen again. So, let's say that one of you, for example, is uh, afraid of spiders. And if you see a spider, how do you respond? Ah, with fear, maybe you try and kill it, maybe you're on a wave, call somebody else to come kill it, right? And what does that do? That removes your anxiety. Oh, I feel better now. But then the next time you see that spider, guess what happens? That anxiety goes right. And then you try and do something to get it down. And we see the same thing in OCD, according to this behavioral model of I am anxious, I try and do something to remove that anxiety. And that doing something, that's a compulsive act. Those compulsive acts uh, then negatively reinforce the fact that I need to do them. I, when I feel bad, I need to do this. And so this behavioral model really can uh, help to explain quite a bit of why we have and why we have compulsive behaviors maintained. But unfortunately, it didn't really explain tons of how the obsessions kind of uh, happened in the first place. And so, uh, with the kind of general zeitgeist of the 1960s in terms of cognitive psychology becoming a thing again, um, we see that a lot of people started getting interested in cognitive explanations of OCD. And those tended to rely on the fact that it turns out that everyone experiences intrusive thoughts. Everybody in here, everywhere else, has at some point an unwanted thought that pops in their head. And they go, ah, what is that? You're walking down the street, you see a puppy, uh, and you have this just flash of yourself just kicking that puppy. And you go, oh, that's terrible. Why would I? That's, that's weird. But then you just go on about your business and you don't focus on it. The cognitive explanation for OCD says, well, what actually happens in OCD is that someone thinks, oh, that really means something about me if I had that intrusive thought. They uh, attribute it to there's something wrong with me. They are very concerned about something negative.
negative happening as a result of that thought. And then that causes them stress. That causes them worry. What does this mean about me? There's something bad about me. There's something wrong with me. And that makes them feel really anxious. And uh, what that does is that helps to explain how do those uh, thoughts kind of maintain themselves. So everybody, like I said, has intrusive thoughts, ideas, and whatnot. But for people with OCD, what happens is when I have one of those, that then is interpreted as being very important that I had that or very threatening in some way. So let's say, for example, that I grew up in an atmosphere that was very uh, hellfire and brimstone-esque, where if you do anything bad, you're going to go to hell. And this is very vast punishments for doing things that are wrong, for thinking the wrong thoughts, for doing behaviors. And so I have this belief system already engaged. Um, if I have that sort of thing, and then I have an intrusive thought, then that may cause me to misinterpret that. And instead of saying, yeah, that's weird. People have thoughts that are weird all the time, and I just ignore it. Instead, I think, oh, no, that means there's something wrong with me. Well, what that then causes is that causes me to feel very, very anxious and upset and worried. And so you know, you're placing a lot of special emphasis on it. Uh, oh, I had this thought, so it must mean it's something that I actually really want to do. Uh, or oh, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna go to hell because I had this thought. In the case of Mark, for example. And so that then makes you very anxious, very upset, and causes that worry to kind of be maintained. Um, now, what we were able to do as a result of having both of these theories, both of which have tons of support for them, uh, is that by not relying just on either one, but on combining our understanding of both the cognitive and the behavioral aspects of OCD, that allows us to have a more fully developed psychological model. And so our cognitive behavioral model of OCD focuses on the bi-directional nature of behavior and cognitions. Uh, and then both of these in turn interact with your emotions. Uh, and so Yes, these obsessions arise from some sort of dysfunctional belief that somebody has, like we saw in the cognitive model. And that causes me to you know, think that these normal thoughts are in some way dangerous, bad, uh, there's something wrong with me. This causes distress. And then what you do with this distress is you try and reduce it. And you try and reduce it via some sort of an escape or avoidance behavior. The problem with this is that whenever I have a distressing thought, and then I try and get rid of that thought, rather than just letting that thought naturally go down and go away, that just reinforces the belief that that thought is dangerous. That reinforces the belief that this is a bad thing. And so this perpetuates this maladaptive belief cycle, which in turn makes you more likely to have these obsessions again in the future. And so going back to our, our sample case here for Mark. Uh, let's say that Mark was raised in a fundamentalist evangelical household um, that and placed a huge amount of emphasis on sin and on people having uh, problems as a result of uh, the devil trying to trick you or trying to make you do things that are negative. So because of this upbringing then, uh, baby plus Satan, he developed a belief system where he thought that Satan could place thoughts into people's heads in order to try and make them do sinful, evil things. And then, one day, as a small kid, he was just doodling on a sheet of paper, uh, and happened, but just by chance, to draw a symbol of an upside-down cross, just a lowercase t. He was just doodling. Didn't mean anything to him. It was a neutral stimulus, in other words. Didn't mean anything to him at all until his dad came by, saw what he had drawn, tore the paper away from him, yelled at him about what a blasphemous thing he had done. And this response from the dad upsets Mark, right? Makes him feel uh, very upset because that's an unconditioned fear of stimulus. So I getting yelled at by a parent makes me feel very, very upset and distressed. And so as a result of this, what happens is Mark comes to associate this particular symbol with something that's very, very distressing. 
So it becomes a conditioned stimulus rather than a neutral stimulus. Now, his father then says, the only thing that you can do right now because you're so upset and you're distressed is you, you've got to get down on your knees, you've got to beg for forgiveness, you've got to pray for forgiveness because here's this terrible thing that you've done. And that's the only way, you know, that God will love you again, that you won't go to hell, whatever the happy looking you know, particular religious belief is. And then after doing that, after praying, uh, I feel better. I feel more relieved. Dad's happy now. No one's yelling at me. I feel better. And so that act, in turn, was negatively reinforcing. And so this, if it was just happened once, wouldn't be that big of a deal. But what we see in OCD is that this doesn't just happen once. And instead, what happens is when he has some sort of intrusive but normal thought, again, maybe triggered by seeing an upside-down T. You know, maybe, maybe somebody has just drawn that on a piece of paper or has practiced, you know, this little kid, they practiced doing their T's, the paper got turned upside down, he sees that. He has this unwanted intrusive thought uh, of his belief system, you know. Satan's sending me this thought to deceive me, to make me uh, fall away from my faith. And that makes him very emotionally distressed. Right? So, trigger, intrusive thought, lots of threatening appraisal. Something, this means something bad about me that I had this thought. I, in turn, am very stressed. And so I have to engage in some sort of a compulsive act in this term prayer to help decrease that anxiety. My anxiety gets better, but unfortunately what happens is that just reinforces the fact that this thought was dangerous. That this was a thought that I needed to be afraid of in some way. And so, unfortunately, what that then makes is that makes these intrusive thoughts more likely to pop up. And it causes you to have more of them. And then you start doing more compulsions to get rid of those thoughts and get rid of the distress, which in turn makes you have more obsessions. And so on and so on and so on. This is why until we developed uh, effective therapy techniques to help with this, um, if you ask somebody 30 years ago, What's the outlook for somebody with OCD? The outlook was, this is a lifelong problem that's going to be very, very terrible for this person. Uh, today, as we'll see, uh, we actually have some really nice therapies that can help to get rid of that. So that's kind of our psychological model. Our most well-supported psychological model is this cognitive behavior. But that doesn't explain necessarily why certain people get this and certain people don't. Because we all have intrusive thoughts. All of us have been exposed to these unconditioned fear stimuli. But not all of us have OCD. A very small number of us have OCD, it turns out. And so this has led people to look for biological causes to say, okay, well, who's most vulnerable to developing this? And over the last 20 years, since the mid-90s, we've had really an explosion of research in this area. Uh, into the biology of OCD, as well as the biology of a number of other mental health problems. Uh, twin studies that have looked at this show a pretty strong genetic influence on OCD, uh, where when you compare dizygotic twins to monozygotic twins, the rates are vastly different. So dizygotic twins who only share 50% you know, of their genes, they have a concordance rate, meaning both twins have OCD, of only about 50%, which is still a pretty high concordance rate. But they share a lot of the same biology. In monozygotic twins, on the other hand, so meaning your identical genes are identical, you see concordance rates of anywhere up to 80 to 90 percent. And that says there's a huge biological underpinning here. Now, there's been lots of work to try to figure out what is that. Uh, so there have been lots of segregation studies, linkage studies, uh, gene association, and genome wide association studies. They've tried to figure out, okay, well, what sort of genes are most contributing to this? And unfortunately, the research has been very consistent. There's something biological that's contributing, uh, but it doesn't seem to be any particular gene. So an SNP, uh, a single uh, nucleotide polymorphism, uh, or even just a small collection of genes. So our largest studies looked at literally thousands and thousands of people with and without OCD, uh, did genome-wide analyses, and found nothing. Uh, 
And so that points to, okay, well, there's something obviously biological that's going on uh, at the molecular level, but we don't know what it is. And so a lot of folks have said, well, you know, we, we may need to start turning to more uh, epigenetically based studies. So it's not just what genes we have, but it's what genes are activated versus non-activated in individuals with OCD. Uh, and that work is kind of currently ongoing. Now moving from a molecular to a structural idea, we actually have a lot of research over the last 20 years on uh, brain differences in folks with and without OCD. And we've seen that damage to particular parts of the brain, basal ganglia, for example, uh, cingulate gyrus, prefrontal cortex, have all been able to be uh, associated with the development of OCD. There's some very interesting rat uh, and other animal models where you go in and you ablate a particular part of the brain and you can see uh, examples, uh, not on humans. Uh, but on, <laughs> everyone's like, oh, what? Uh, this is terrible. Uh, but no, just on rats and other animals, and you can see them develop these kinds of OCD behaviors uh, very quickly with just a small change to the brain. Um, certain areas of the brain, the hepatic nucleus, the lower front cortex, they show very decreased activity. Uh, and we see other problems in terms of smaller areas like the uh, plantum collar region, uh, where the volume of the brain is decreased, the brain is really smaller in that area, and folks have OCD. Uh, so, returning to uh, our, our case study with Mark, uh, our little fellow that we've been talking about this whole time. Um, from a familial or a biological perspective, um, we could say that maybe, maybe his parents have struggled with being very highly anxious. Um, that causes them problems at home, that causes them problems in the workplace. And then Mark, in turn, uh, inherited an overall genetic predisposition towards both experiencing and then displaying anxiety. And when activated, these genes then impacted the neurochemical production of things like serotonin, uh, glutamate, and then this in turn led to disruptive patterns of activation across the brain. Um, this pattern is probably most elevate, or evident in the orbitofrontal cortex, this little, little place right there, um, which is actually seems to be responsible for two key aspects of problematic behaviors in OCD. Uh, the repeated doubts that you have, did I actually do this? And then the behaviors that you manifest as a result of those doubts. So in Mark, this biological then kind of overactivation of this particular area is manifested in repeatedly asking for forgiveness after his blasphemous thoughts, after his intrusive thoughts that he's having and then questioning other people in terms of them saying, oh, you know, they're not accurate, those are not congruent with reality. And he says, no, no, they are, you don't even know, you don't even know because of how stressed I am. And so that would sort of be a, a biological understanding of what would cause, you know, this particular case to have OCD. Now stepping back even further, uh, to another level of explanation. Both the biological mechanisms that we just talked about and the psychological components of OCD uh, appear to have their roots in very normal function. So again, um, everybody has these intrusive thoughts at times. Everybody does escape and avoidance behaviors to get rid of anxiety. And so what we may see is that in OCD, this is basically an exaggerated version of some normal, evolutionarily adaptive behaviors. If you don't try and escape when you're feeling afraid and distressed, it turns out that's probably not going to work out too well for you. In the long run. You know, if I'm, let's say, uh, 15,000 years ago, uh, trying to hunt down a saber-toothed tiger and it starts running towards me, I'm like, yeah, you know what, I got this. I'm right. Then I might not be able to pass my genes on to the next generation because I will be inside of that saber-toothed tiger's stomach. Um, likewise, these intrusive thoughts, as we'll see, seem to be a natural function of some of our metacognitive abilities. Well, what happens in OCD then is that our responses to threats are greatly overestimated. Uh, so, for example, 
yeah, there's a chance that if I go to the public restroom and it's just disgustingly dirty and filthy and I use it, then maybe there's a chance I might get sick. But there's a very small chance of that happening. And we know this because, you know, we have children or we've seen children. We know they're just disgusting little germ <laughs> factories. And most, many of them survive, right? Um, and that's okay. Uh, so then what we see in OCD is that these threat estimates are greatly exaggerated. So instead of saying, oh, there's like a 0 0.2 chance of me getting sick from going to this public restroom, it's like, no, it's a 100% chance. The threat is real, people. And what this does in turn is this kind of overwhelms an individual's resources and ability to actually cope with that anxiety. So from an evolutionary standpoint, then, uh, it seems like this may be understandable. Right? And OCD is probably something that has uh, been selected for throughout our evolutionary history because in a normative, non-exaggerated way, it's adaptive. Which really confuses a lot of people. They're like, well, OCD is obviously not adaptive, right? These people have huge amounts of problems and very distressed. Their entire lives can be disrupted. Um, and I'm not talking about having OCD as being adaptive. I'm talking about having obsession and compulsions as being adaptive. Not to the level that you see in OCD, because that's an over exaggeration, but instead at a lower level. And so if we look at um, traditional ways of viewing a trait as adaptive or maladaptive, Adaptive traits tend to have four hallmarks. First is they have a lack of heritable variation. So in other words, they're pretty constant across the population. Second, they have evidence of good design, meaning they help you adapt to your environment. Third is that they're evoked by appropriate triggers. You know, they're not just happening all the time if in response to nothing. And fourth is that if those behaviors are absent, those traits are absent, then your fitness, your evolutionary fitness, meaning your ability to reproduce, which your genes to the next generation, tends to be reduced. Uh, with OCD and obsessions and compulsions, it turns out it fits all four of these. I'll demonstrate that. First, in terms of um, a lack of heritable variation, based on what we know about biology of obsessive compulsive disorder, then we would think, well, okay, uh, if there are things specifically that would cause OCD to develop, then those should be some sort of insult or injury. Uh, and so, you know, at a proximal level, what we're talking about is psychopathology, obsessive compulsive disorder in this case, developing due to some sort of genetic or biological brain deficient, uh, deficiency. Like, for example, the basic ganglia damage that we see, which it could actually lead to a lack in behavioral inhibition, which in turn decreases your ability to uh, monitor your own behavior and determine whether or not the behavior is okay and accurate. And we definitely see that in OCD. Um, we also see, again, this is very cross-culturally prevalent. Uh, it's at a very constant rate across the globe, which says that, you know, in our past, then, these OC traits have been selected for, and that's that lack of heritable variation. Um, now, what sort of traits would these be? Why would we have these? Uh, our best supported hypotheses, because a lot of these are kind of difficult to test without a time machine, um, but our best supported hypothesis is that you know, a potential mechanism, uh, mental mechanism that evolved over time in us as a species, uh, and in a lot of our other related species, it turns out, involves our ability to imagine consequences without having to engage in. So this is something we all do. Like we all think ahead. Well, if I run out in the middle of that busy street, I'll probably get squashed. So I don't want to do that. Right? I'm not just responding to my environment. I'm thinking ahead. Um, and what this does is this then causes us to develop uh, habits that help us avoid harm. So I would look both ways before I cross the street, for example. And that's something that humans do. You know, uh, squirrels don't do that. They're not very good at that. If they were, we'd see a lot fewer of them squashed, right? Uh, but they don't have that sort of higher level cognitive skill that humans do. And so that particular uh, ability of humans seems to probably be related to our OC development. Um, now, in terms of the compulsion aspects, we actually do see a lot more of that across the other animal species. Um, 
the most common kinds of compulsions actually seem to be deer and have analogs in the behavior of other mammals. Um, so hoarding behaviors, for example, that we see people do, where I just I get large amounts of things and I have to have them and I need to have them. You see that with other animals. You've ever heard the term pack rat. You know, we didn't just make that up out of nowhere. You know, there are certain certain animals that do that. Uh, whether it's hoarding food, whether it's like some rats hoarding uh, string and other kind of nonsense, um, grooming and cleaning behaviors that we see, nest building that we see, uh, all of those kind of habitual behaviors uh, are reflected in a lot of the OCD behaviors that we see in terms of our compulsions. Uh, we call these uh, things FAPs, which is uh, fixed action patterns. And so these, these FAPs then seem to have combined with our metacognitive skills, our uniquely human metacognitive skills, that allowed us to mentally represent the future, over-exaggerate possible problems that could happen, and then respond in a way that allowed us to reduce the, that anxiety. So in other words, I touch that doorknob, so thanks to my uniquely human behaviors, what I can do, or with cognitions, I can think, oh my god, there's probably germs on there. I saw somebody cough and then they opened the door, and now I've probably got those disease vectors here in my hand. You know, patient zero is going to affect me next. You know? And I can think about that out there, and then I, oh, I got to do something to get rid of that. And so I get out my Purell, right, and I go to town, uh, or I go to the bathroom at my house and I pour bleach all over my hands in order to kill all those germs, which I've seen people do all the time about this. Turns out it doesn't do wonders for your skin. Um, and so when you go from these uh, fixed action patterns and these kind of uniquely human metacognitive skills, it's not too hard to think of OCD as being an exaggerated version of those. So it's it's gone wrong. Evolutionarily adaptive behavior. So if we try and kind of step back from all these individual things, psychological, biological, evolutionary, um, and look at the bigger picture, then what we can do is we can start putting together a comprehensive etiological model. And what this does is this allows us to say, okay, in terms of ultimate roots of OCD, for us as a species, we can consider these normative adaptive behaviors, what would they look like if they were disrupted? Well, it turns out they look a lot like OCD. And then moving to the next level, okay, well, but why doesn't everybody have OCD? Well, maybe there's some specific biological aspects that help us understand a particular person's vulnerability to developing OCD. And then these biological aspects then combine with their environment. Now helps us understand the psychological aspects. And that provides a lot of explanatory power for why certain people develop OCD. Again, even in uh, monozygotic twins, where they share the exact same DNA, it's not a 100% concordance rate. So there's something going on in the environment that will cause them to experience this. And it turns out that this, the psychological understanding, this environmental understanding, helps to inform our most effective intervention. Because I can't you know, go back in time and change what behaviors were selected for across our, our evolutionary history. Uh, I can't change your genetic code. But what I can do is I can change your environment and how you respond to your environment. And this is the underpinnings of cognitive behavioral therapy, which very heavily focuses on exposure and response prevention, which helps to attack the behavioral aspect and cognitive restructuring, which helps to attack the obsessional cognitive aspect of OCD. And it turns out this is extraordinarily effective, um, with up to 85% of individuals experiencing symptom reduction when they go through cognitive behavioral therapy. And what we see is that this causes changes at other levels. So I can't change your genes by changing your therapy. But it turns out I can change brain activity. And I can change brain structure development. And so what we see is that changing the behavioral 
and the cognitive aspects causes biological changes in those boys. And so in doing this, we're really we're hitting a multi-level cause of what's going on with OCD. So if you'll bear with me, I'll give you a comprehensive model of what happened with Mark and why Mark might have this OCD. So Mark's distant ancestors, um, maybe even going back about 100 million years to the last common ancestors between birds and mammals, had evolutionary pressures on them that helped them to shape certain predispositions uh, for certain types of ritualistic and habitual behaviors that in turn aided survival. Uh, this actually coincides with the development of more sophisticated basal ganglia, uh, which is an area of the brain that we know is highly implicated OCD today. With the gradual development across time uh, of the Homo genus, uh, Erectus, Ancestor, Rodensius, and the rise of kind of anatomically modern Homo sapiens around 200,000 years ago, uh, our species became increasingly cognitively sophisticated uh, thanks to really rapid brain growth. And this brain growth was most relevant or most pronounced in the neocortex, thalamus, and the limbic areas. This sophistication then kind of exploded over the last 60,000 years, uh, and we developed lots of new brain functions uh, to increase our survival chances uh, in an increasingly social environment. And this included things like advanced communication, advanced planning abilities, and at the same time we began to develop Concurrent to that, the ability to conceptualize potentially negative, adverse consequences of future actions. And these metacognitive functions then were highly useful to the species as a whole. I can anticipate danger, I can do things to avoid that. And so, unfortunately, due to certain kinds of insults, these adaptive, ritualistic, metacognitive behaviors can become hijacked and can become maladaptive. And so, these allele frequency changes, the evolution uh, that gave rise to these new adaptive brain structures, and these functional changes were passed from generation to generation uh, and became very widespread among the Homo uh, sapiens. And they spread out across from Africa and some of the waves over the last 60,000 years. Uh, and those, unlike many morphological features, uh, skin color, hair color, these uh, alleles that would be responsible for metacognition and ritualist behavior were relatively intact across the population. Uh, Mark's ancestors carry those genes, uh, and he carries them as well. But in Mark, what happened is that adaptive functioning has been disrupted. Both of Mark's parents were highly anxious people, and so he subsequently inherited an overall genetic vulnerability to experiencing anxiety. In particular, he had a dysregulation of the serotonergic system, and that caused patterns of brain activation uh, across side of those areas that what you see in most people. These disruptions have affected his entire brain, uh, but most problematic aspects were seen in things like the basal ganglia, the thalamus, and the neocortex, these relatively new areas of the brain. And then this basal ganglia thalamocortical circuit disruption means that what's going on with Mark is he's most likely are more likely, I'm sorry, uh, than most people to experience difficulties with excessive doubts and repetitive behaviors. But he needs some sort of activating event in his environment for those to become problematic and prominent. Uh, unfortunate for Mark, his environment uh, was filled with this. So in addition to being highly anxious, Mark's parents were both fundamentalist uh, evangelical Christians, and so he was exposed to a large number of beliefs early on in his life that Satan uh, could place thoughts into his head in order to try and make him do something sinful or evil. And then one day when he was young, Mark was doodling on a sheet of paper and happened by chance to draw an upside down T. It didn't mean anything to him, it was a neutral stimulus, until his mother came by, saw what he'd done, tore the paper from him, yelled at him about how blasphemous his actions were, um, and that response made Mark very upset. So his mother's reaction was an unconditioned stimulus, a fear stimulus. He didn't want to disappoint his mom. He didn't want to go to hell uh, for being blasphemous. Now, for most people, they would get mildly upset, and that would have been the end of the story. Right? 
But for Mark, as a result of his previously evolutionary adaptive skills becoming hijacked by biological disruptions, he more readily begins to associate that symbol with a fear response. And so the prayers that he's then instructed to engage in his mother in, as a result of that sinful behavior, they greatly alleviate his distress. They, that in turn then reinforces through negative reinforcement that he should pray whenever he encounters these blasphemous kinds of activities or symbols. And so later, Mark has an intrusive, unwanted, but actually normal kind of thought about drawing an upside down cross. This thought then activates his belief system. Satan's sending me this thought to turn me evil, turn me away from righteousness. And it makes him very emotionally distressed. But rather than just waiting for that anxiety to dissipate naturally, he instead uses something that was previously reinforced to help alleviate that uh, unnatural and cause a compulsion. And unfortunately, what happens then is that behavior just reinforces that negative belief system. And then in turn makes those obsessions more likely to pop up again. And then, in this sort of a fashion, a set of cognitive and behavioral adaptations that in most of the population are useful becomes highly maladaptive. And that impacts both his biology and his psychosocial function. And so that's kind of why Mark has OCD, looking at it from a very large scale of view. Now, people tend to want really simple explanations for like, why someone has OCD? But real life very rarely cooperates with that. Simple pad explanations for anything tend to ignore uh, large amounts of information that we have, obscure the truth. And so in order to really understand why does someone have anything, whether it be OCD, depression, why does someone act the way that they do, we really in psychology have to look at a multi-level explanation of things. And in particular, when we're talking about disorders, we need to be able to look at something that encompasses uh, and takes into account evolutionary, biological, and psychological factors, not ignoring any one of those areas. So, so that's the story of OCD and Mark and